Good morning, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Uh, thank you so much. We're really appreciative of you joining us today for Healthier Here's um, webinar. Uh, we've had a lot going on, and it's been quite a while since we've done a webinar for all of our partners. Um, so we're looking forward to bringing you up to speed and, and catching you up on um, some of the work that we've been doing primarily on planning for our 2019 investment strategy and sharing with you where we are in the process. So um, before we get started, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I am Susan McLaughlin. I'm the executive director of Healthier Here, and I will be uh, primarily presenting our webinar today. Um, let me... Uh, Not there we go. Um, I first wanted to wish you again all a happy Valentine's Day. And if we were all in the room together, I'd be sharing a box of chocolates with you. Uh, but since we are uh, doing this virtually, you'll have to have some virtual chocolates. Um, but happy Valentine's Day and thanks for joining us. Um, this slide just shows a little bit about the webinar logistics. So we will have staff um, managing the chat room throughout the webinar. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the chat box. If it is an easily um, answered question, you might get a response directly back from one of the staff that are managing it. If it's a question that um, is more appropriate for everybody to hear um, or needs me to provide an answer, then um, we will be pausing and staff will be asking those questions out loud. Um, so do feel free to uh, raise your hand or send questions via chat. We'll have plenty of time um, at the end uh, to do question and answer as well. And this is just uh, some more information. Um, are we going to do the, the speak or uh, just through the chat? Uh, they can kind of take their pick. They can do either. Okay. So if you do want to speak directly, um, raise your hand. But you do, I will say that you need to make sure that when you logged on um, that you did enter your audio pin. Otherwise, you won't be able to speak and you'll have to interact um, and ask your questions through chat. All right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, our goals for today are to share with you the process that Healthier Here has been going through to develop our 2019 investment strategy for our Medicaid transformation. Um, we also will uh, take you on a tour through our investment prioritization tool. And then um, finally, we'll share the results of the investment prioritization process and uh, give you some uh, window into how we'll be moving forward with implementation and making investments in, um, in 2019. So before uh, we jump right into the investment process, though, I just want to uh, ground everybody and remind you about why we're doing this and, uh, and um, how we're moving forward. So we know that uh, clinical care represents only about one-fifth of the factors that impact people's overall health and well-being. Um, and so in order to improve the health of, of our community and the people in our community, we have to not only make sure that we are have easily accessible, high quality, culturally competent clinical care, but we also need to make sure that we are um, effectively addressing uh, factors that impact overall health, like housing and access to healthy food, um, socioeconomic factors, and other social determinants of health. Right now, today, we have a, um, a system, a, a broad system that is fragmented, um, uh, disconnected, and really, really hard for people and families to navigate. And our vision for the future is to have a connected system of whole person care where people, um, and, and this says people on Medicaid, but really at the end of the day, we want all people in King County to be healthier because they get the right care at the right time and in the right place. Um, the Medicaid Transformation Project is focusing on the Medicaid population, and as we move out the door um, with implementation and go first, we will be focusing on um, individuals who are on Medicaid, but really we want to connect the system in such a way that regardless of a person's insurance, um, that they're gonna get the, get the best care and have the best outcome. 
So we are um, trying to build a, a system that is connected and um, in 2019, we'll really be focusing on laying the foundation. Um, we've got to strengthen the capacity, both in terms of clinical healthcare providers, but also um, with regard to the community-based organizations that are providing those social services that address social determinants of health. And even more importantly, um, one of the, the main priorities and goals for Healthier Here is to convene and engage partners across those two sectors and start to build the bridges of interconnectivity between the clinical, what happens in the clinical um, healthcare world and what happens in community and community-based organizations. Um, we are working with partners, um, both uh, Medicaid healthcare providers or our clinical partners and community partners. Uh, we are, um, the, our work with the clinical partners has progressed a little bit faster than our work with our community partners um, because uh, we, our community is so big. We have so many community-based organizations and building those um, community relationships and the trust with our uh, community-based organizations takes time. Um, we've been very intentional in that process, and it is moving along as we narrow into uh, what community-based organizations will become practice partners with us. So I want you to know that that um, is moving forward, and we will soon have that cadre of community-based practice partners that will be working with us and a set of investment areas to help build infrastructure and capacity within our community-based organizations. But that is not going to be our focus for today. Um, our focus today is going to be the work that has happened on the clinical healthcare delivery side and the investments that we will be making with our Medicaid healthcare partners. Uh, once we have the community-based organization work um, done, which will be in the next couple of months, uh, we'll be able to talk with you then about investment strategies for community-based organizations as well. Um, so it is happening, we are working with them, um, and it's just moving at a little bit of a different pace than the clinical side. So uh, the governing board of Healthier Here back in 2017, when we were building our project portfolio and our um, that we needed to turn into the healthcare authority, spent some time doing some work, thinking about what success um, could and should look like in our region recognizing that the um, 1115 Medicaid waiver is a time-limited opportunity with a um, limited amount of resources. Uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but we can't do everything um, in the time period and with the resources of the waiver. So we needed to be very um, strategic and focused on what we saw as um, the main outcomes that we would achieve through the waiver opportunity. And this is um, what you see on the slide here in front of you is what the board came up with uh, for us as setting sort of that North Star of what success would look like. And um, for Healthier Here and for our region, it's four things. It's creating mechanisms for meaningful community and consumer voice that helps drive decision making for healthcare and um, healthcare transformation and for Healthier Here as a whole. Uh, to, to have access to care teams that, that are representative, culturally competent, and respectful of individuals and their community. To make sure that we have computer systems that talk to each other to improve the community and clinical connections and the information flow um, and sharing both across providers and provider types. And then finally, that we have payment models that compensate providers for keeping people healthy rather than the numbers of procedures a person receives. And that account for community-based organizations um, and their contribution to better health and um, our overall outcomes. So now I'm gonna move into what went into the development of our investment strategy. This um, has been a process of shared stewardship. We, in the, in the, um, the planning and thinking about how our investments uh, should play out in 2019, we have involved all four of our formal committees of the board. So our Community and Consumer Voice Committee, our Finance Committee, our Performance Measurement and Data Committee, as well as our Transformation Committee. And um, uh, what we decided to do is bring these four committees together jointly um, across 
uh, uh, what will be four meetings. We've had three of those four joint meetings mm -hmm. already. So that um, the committee is really shared in responsibility of helping us think about the best use of resources and the greatest impact and um, can jointly bring a recommendation to the governing board for approval. Um, you guys, most of you have heard me say this many, many times, but uh, the 1115 Medicaid waiver is not a grant. It is not grant funding um, to us as an organization from the healthcare authority, nor is it grant funding that we grant out to our partner organizations. It's a pay for performance at the system level so that the funds will flow from the federal government to our state healthcare authority. Um, we, as the ACH for our region, um, will be measured upon how successful we are, um, both in terms of reporting um, certain things to the state as well as our performance on outcome measures. And this is how we earn incentive dollars for our region. In um, year one and year two of the 1115 waiver, 2017 and 2018, 100% of our incentive dollars uh, were earned by reporting things to the state. So it, this included things like our um, submitting our project application. We have to submit semi-annual reports to the state. We needed to complete an implementation plan. And for each of those uh, reporting deliverables, we were evaluated by an independent assessor and, uh, and then we're awarded incentive dollars. Um, we've been really lucky here, healthier here, and we've been able to earn 100% of our uh, pay for reporting dollars so far. As we move into 2019, more and more of our incentive dollars become at risk based on our performance on the outcome metrics, the system level metrics that uh, are attached to our project portfolio and required by the healthcare authority. So beginning this year, 25% of our up to amount of money that we can earn is going to be at risk for pay for performance. And that increases to 50% in 2020 and then goes up to 75% in 2021. And what that means is that we need to be very strategic in how we invest our dollars early on, being very mindful of making sure that we're improving the outcomes. Otherwise, um, in the outer years of the waiver, we will not receive um, all of our incentive dollars. So the other thing that's important to know about uh, building our investment strategy is that the governing board has also already provided some framework and guidance to us in how we move this forward. So again, back in 2017, when we completed our uh, project application, the governing board had to may, um, come up with a distribution formula and allocation of funds in particular use categories that were set by the healthcare authority. And what the governing board has allocated is that um, right now is 63% of our earned incentive dollars would go to um, partner organizations. And that 63% is further divided up and allocated between Medicaid providers. So 50% of the 63% would go to the traditional Medicaid healthcare providers. 42% of that 63% would go to our non-Medicaid community-based organizations, and 8% of that 63% will go to tribes. The governing board then allocated 15% of our earned incentive dollars to our um, system-level investments around population health, workforce development, um, and uh, health information exchange. That uh, resource is also further allocated between Medicaid, non-Medicaid, and our tribes. And it is those dollars, the 63 plus the 15 percent, or 70 percent of our earned incentive dollars, that we are talking about when we talk about our investment strategy for 2019. The remaining 22 percent of the budget allocation is not part of this investment prioritization process. These dollars are reserved um, for things like the Healthier Here Administrative Budget, our Equity and Wellness Fund. Uh, we do have a reserve fund in case we um, have a decrease in uh, the available funding to us um, and so forth. So it's that 78% of the dollars, um, incentive dollars that we're talking about in our investment strategy. 
And we really are trying to build an investment strategy, and um, and this is not an easy task. We have to, as we move forward and think about how we um, make uh, greatest use and greatest opportunity of our investments, we need to think about the balance between the amount of money that goes to individual provider organizations to help support them in their transformation efforts versus system level investments that really create the interconnectedness and, and the broader scale change that we're looking for. And then we also have to balance uh, the resources that go to our traditional Medicaid providers versus our community-based organizations and our tribes. And although these uh, puzzle pieces are all the same size, in reality, they uh, will not be the same size as we move forward with our investment strategy. Okay, so we're going to tell you a little bit about the journey that we've been on um, to put the pieces together for our strategy. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because um, uh, a lot of this will be just a refresher and reminder for you guys of what we, we, what we did. But back in 2017 when the waiver was signed, um, this was really the phase of the waiver that was uh, launched and designed. And um, we as an organization, Healthier Here, were in our formative years. Get, uh, building a governing board, developing our policies and procedures and bylaws. Um, the board set a five-year budget, as I already um, went through with you, and we also spent 2017 selecting our projects for our project portfolio. So that was the first, those were the um, first indicators of trying to narrow down and focus in on what we were going to do. And then in early 2018, we spent a lot of time assessing the need and the capacity. And many of our um, uh, healthcare provider organizations completed current state assessments, health information, health IT assessments, um, have participated in value-based payment surveys. Um, we similarly put out community-based organi organizations, small grants um, to help gather information from Medicaid beneficiaries. And we are... Um, also in a process of, of doing similar kinds of assessments with our community-based organizations with regard to their readiness and um, needs and capacities. Later on in, in 2018, we spent time engaging and selecting um, various partners on the medical side to work with us. And over the summer, uh, we went through a process where we further narrowed the pool of, of provider organizations and invited um, certain practice partners to submit a change plan for us and tell us um, about how they are thinking about transformation in their organization. Um, we also started pushing out um, resources in later in 2019 to all of our um, medical providers um, to support participation and planning and engagement activities that happened. And then we started uh, really digging into the planning and prioritizing. Um, we worked with the partners over the um, late summer and early fall to develop the clinical summaries, which have set the foundation for what transformation should look like. We've had subject matter um, expertise work groups, uh, developed our investment prioritization tool, which you'll hear about, and then ultimately all of that led to our submittal of an implementation plan in October of 2018. And now we're in implementation and ready to go forward with all of the things that we have been talking about and saying that we're going to do. And um, that begins with an investment strategy that, uh, that tells us how we're going to invest the resources of Healthier Here. So the investment prioritization process has been a very disciplined process that we have been walking through, as I mentioned, with our four formal committees um, of our governing board. This is a high-level overview um, of that disciplined process, and then I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail. It started with um, what we call the investment input list. This is basically all the ideas about what we could potentially or should um, invest our dollars in to help support the system. We then created an investment prioritization tool, which we're going to walk you through. And then each of the strategies on that investment input list were, were walked through that tool. Um, scored and reviewed, um, and then once that was done, we did a cost budget analysis, and then that um, analysis is resulting in the development of our 2019 investment budgets and strategy. So we're going to go through those in um, more detail. 
The investment input list, again, is what are all the things that Healthier Here could potentially fund? What do practice partners say they need? What does the system need? Where are their care gaps and overlaps? Um, and so this was a very comprehensive list that came um, from input from all of the design groups that we ran in 2017, our implementation work groups in 2018, all of the assessments that our practice partners completed and the information that was in there, our work with committees, the change plans that came in, and through our follow-up meetings with partners and internal analysis of all of that information, we were able to, um, to create a list of, fit of um, ideas and strategies that we could invest in. And then we had to develop this uh, a tool to evaluate, to measure and evaluate these strategies. And so Healthier Here worked with our um, a consultant organization with Manat to develop a priority prioritization tool. And the reason we needed this tool, as you probably are well aware, is that the input list and the the list of things that we could invest in was bigger than the amount of money we have available to us. And so we had to come up with um, some sort of way and mechanism that was objective and um, and transparent to to decide if we don't have the resources to do everything, where are we going to start and how are we going to focus? And that's what the, the investment prioritization um, tool does. We developed criteria for investment and weighting. Um, so we have um, created a set of values that you see at the top of this slide, equity, innovation, viability, systemic leveraging, and sustainability. These were developed in partnership with our committees and with our governing board. And it was the governing board that um, eventually weighted those values um, and giving higher weight to the first three and um, and a lower weight to the bottom three and that and we took that into consideration in the in the development of the tool as well um, and so then we needed to to using that tool and using that criteria determine which investments were going to be highest priority for 2019 um, so there was a, a scoring and review process. Uh, at the joint committee meetings, they would review the process, the uh, um, uh, prioritization tool and the investment input list and first determine is there anything on the list that they couldn't live with? Did we get the list right? Is there anything you know critical missing? And then our Healthier Here staff and consultants use the prior or as a prioritization tool to analyze score and rank order the investments. And then they went back again to the, the joint committee meetings to see if the ranking made sense and aligned with our vision and values. And um, kind of we sort of um, talk about that as the eyeball test, like, you know, the analytics and the scoring can go take you so far, but you still have to have a conversation about whether the results made sense or not. Um, and then we have to figure out how much revenue is available to invest, what are the costs, of each of those investment strategies, because um, if you know, um, they some of them could cost millions of dollars, and we might decide that the cost benefit isn't there, and we might opt to do different things. Um, in that process, we need to understand what is the likelihood we will hit our metrics, because that impacts how much revenue we will receive, um, and estimate that revenue, and then look at the um, difference between uh, the cost of the investments and our projected revenue. And that uh, led to or is leading to our 2019 investment budgets. And then this will be a um, sort of an ongoing feedback loop because based on how, how things go in 2019, how we invest our resources, how successful we are, um, and uh, will determine then our future investments. Um, if, we, if things are not working, for example, uh, we may course correct, we may reallocate resources in a different direction so that we can get better outcomes. Uh, things that are working that we're testing, we may decide to take to scale and, and spread to other organizations further. So um, we'll reevaluate um, everything every year uh, to determine the future investments. Okay, um, how are we doing? Any questions or anything like no that? No questions. So okay, far. great. Um, so I'm going to now take you on a tour of the investment prioritization tool so you can see what that looked like. 
Um, it was a gated model that was developed by um, our, uh, as I mentioned, our Healthier Hair staff and Manat. Uh, we used input from our board and our committees to help us figure out the right gates and uh, the right uh, criteria within those gates. And again, this um, having the tool really provided an opportunity for objectivity to inform the decision making about our investment strategy and provide transparency to um, our board and our committees as well as our community partners. So everybody understood at the end of the day why um, we're investing in the things we're choosing to invest in. And then the committees have reviewed this all along. Um, the scoring, uh, just so you know, as we developed the process and the scoring uh, criteria, we first had, um, once we had the, the model and the scoring process developed, we had what we call a calibration team here at Healthier Here that met and conducted a dry run of the investment prioritization tool so that we could calibrate the scoring, make sure that we have, we get it right, that we have, that there, there's consistency in how people scored and that the scoring process worked with what we were trying to do and the kinds of um, strategies that we were investing in. Um, once it was all kind of baked um, and ready to go, we created an evaluation team that was a combination of um, Healthier Here staff and subject matters from, uh, from our consultant organization. They met and scored the investments against our values and our pay for performance metrics. And then the Healthier Here Finance team and Manat consolidated all of the scores and came up with uh, did the weighting, did the weighting, and then the ranking of the investment strategies. Um, so we already talked about the investment input list. It started there, um, and uh, it, you already know how that was created. Um, so the first gate was an evaluation of the list of investment strategies against healthier here values. And again, this um, shows you what those values are um, and also how they were weighted. Some values were weighted higher than others. Um, all, of the, all of the strategies on the investment input list were evaluated against the values but only those that um, were above the 50th percentile threshold, suggesting that they were most aligned with these values that you see, made it through the first gate. So not all investment strategies moved on to the second gate. There was a smaller number, um, but those that did move on and that scored above the 50th percentile were then um, in the second gate where they were evaluated against um, their ability to help us hit our um, 19 pay for performance metrics that we're accountable to. So the investments were scored based on their ability to impact the metric during the Medicaid transformation timeline. Um, and then they were also evaluated or wait, I, not, I should say weighted based on their potential for earning us revenue. So the other thing that you may recall is not not all metrics are created equal, and some of the metrics in that list of 19 are um, can earn us more revenue than other metrics. And so we um, also took that into consideration as we were doing the weighting so that those higher value metrics received a higher weight because we, we knew they would generate more income for us. And then finally, um, they, the um, tool then came out with a uh, ranked list of, of the strategies based on their score or evaluation on um, values and pay for performance. And then um, those options were reviewed with the committee and then would be costed out based on their priority level. And this just uh, says that again, so I'm going to move on. All right, so we're gonna move on to the results here. Um, so this is what the um, investment option themes look like. We, I didn't, um, we didn't put in here each one of the investments on the list, although we can certainly make that available to people. It was just too much information um, and we've moved so far beyond that. But if people are interested what was on the list, we can, we're happy to share that. But these are the categories um, of things that were on that list. So um, organization-specific resources, this was um, requ uh, requests for specific types of uh, staffing, you know, uh, licensed clinical staff. Um, it might be, it might be a staff people for, uh, to do population, uh, like a population health manager 
staff person in an organization, those kinds of resources that would go directly to individual organizations. The second bucket was uh, system level investments, and this is things like um, health information exchange, shared care planning, um, things that help uh, the system connect better. Um, an innovation fund, this is resource available to do, to uh, catalyze and test innovation, new ways of doing things. And then there were some strategies around um, other types of infrastructure or system gap, um, uh, system gap uh, mechanisms that folks were looking for to be filled as well. So we started with a list of 23 investment options that were evaluated against the healthier here values. Um, 12 of those 23 investment options scored above the 50th percentile and advanced to gate number two to be evaluated against our uh, pay for performance. And then um, those were then weighted and aggregated and prioritized. Um, so we're just gonna show you a little bit of um, how that played out. These again, this is just a reminder of the values. And these, um, this shows you the performance of each of the, the top 12 um, uh, strategies. So along the bottom are the investment strategies that were on the input list. Um, and then the score and then the um, kind of brownish orange line shows you where the 50th percentile was and what scored above, what items scored above that. So these are the top 12 items that made it through the first gate. And then just so you can see, this is the um, bottom 11 items that did not make it through the first gate and that therefore were not considered um, for the second round. And then the second gate, again, was our pay for performance metrics. Um, this slide shows you what those metrics are. We categorized them kind of into groups. Uh, many of them are related to hospital and emergency department use. Uh, there's a, sub, a, a group of metrics related to behavioral health performance, uh, chronic disease, and then um, opioid, and then other metrics that didn't fit into those categories. Um, and again, the uh, strategies were scored based on their likely ability to impact these metrics during the timeline, and then weighted for their earning potential. And so here is the results of the valuation against the pay for performance metrics uh, for the top those 12 uh, strategies that made it through the first gate that were most aligned with our values and then this is the end result of all of that once everything was weighted and aggregated together um, these are in rank order the finalists from one um, meaning it scored the, up, the highest all the way through 12 um, the, that, that was um, scored the lowest in the ranking of those top strategies. And then I will just point out again and remind people that these are, um, all of these strategies were strategies that were identified by the, our healthcare delivery system, not by our community-based organizations. And there will be similarly a list of um, investment strategies that our community-based organizations uh, tell us they need that will go through a similar process and complement to this. And so we're holding that um, space on the slide uh, for whatever those strategies look like, just to remind people that there's a separate bucket of dollars. So reminding you all the way back to the beginning of this presentation and the board allocation of funding, remember that 63% of dollars that uh, that was dedicated to um, provider organizations, well, actually the whole 78% um, was split between Medicaid providers and community-based organizations. And so, um, uh, so there will be a bucket of money um, set aside for the community-based organizations for their investment priority areas. Okay. So that is um, our, the results of our tool and where we landed. And so we have a set of 12 um, strategies. Um, and now we got to figure out what do we do with that and how do we move forward? Um, so the first thing um, that we have been talking with our committees about is that while we are emphasizing right now through the investment process, um, the money and the spending of the money and how we will invest resources, 
Um, the roles of Healthier here are really bigger and broader than just making investments. And it's important um, to remember that as we think about how we move the work forward um, and what the, the goals we are trying to accomplish are, because Healthier Here's role may or may not be investing in, in a particular strategy or being the only one to invest in a strategy, but we play other critical roles as well. So convening is one of those. Um, one of our big roles is convening partners um, and stakeholders around specific topics. Um, we have our learning collaboratives that are project specific, that are bringing um, right now together the healthcare uh, providers that are participating in the same projects together and, and eventually will include the community-based organizations that are participating in those projects as well. Um, things like a shared care plan, you'll hear me talk about this. Uh, shared care planning is, is um, a high priority for our region and, and what people are saying they, um, they would love for us to invest in and have. We can't go out to Target next week and buy a shared care plan um, per se. There's some work that needs to be done first. Um, Healthier Hair needs to convene partners and we need to define what do we mean by a shared care plan? What are the data elements that should go into a shared care plan? How do we create standardized um, processes and protocols and governance of that data in the shared care plan? And then um, what kind of technology do we need to support it? And then we can, can invest in that uh, kind of activity. So convening is um, a large role that we play. Investing, we, we're, we'll talk a lot about that, but obviously we want to invest in strategies that are going to lead to a transformed system, and they will include system level um, investments like training and technical assistance and a clinical um, or community information exchange, and they also might include um, organizational uh, investments um, like incentives to optimize the use of pre-managed or um, non-traditional staffing that um, creates innovative models to test new, new ways of doing business. Policy is another important role that Healthier Here plays in all of this. Um, we'll be participating in both local and statewide policy making um, as it relates to our transformation goals and what we're trying to achieve. So, for example, we may, may be participating um, with the healthcare authority um, in helping to de define um, different contract requirements that would go into managed care contracts that support the kinds of models of new models of care or new ways of doing business. We might uh, do specific work with the healthcare authority to obtain um, different kinds of funding sources to help with um, some of the things we're trying to achieve so it doesn't have to all come out of our waiver dollars if there's other resources available. Um, and then we will participate really actively in trying to remove some of the regulatory barriers that get in the way of what we're trying to do. So for example, um, the, some of them are billing codes, making sure we have the right billing codes available to us to do the transformation, or it might be things like licensing and certification barriers that get in the way of providing integrated care at a single site and so forth. And then the last, um, but certainly not the least um, important thing here is sustainability. So we certainly don't want to make all of these investments in um, different things and then when the waiver money goes away, all the work goes away as well. So it will be important for us to be identifying mechanisms that will help sustain the Medicaid transformation investments and strategies. And so we'll be working with our managed care partners and the healthcare authority to identify value-based payment arrangements that might support the new care models that we're looking to um, implement and sustain. And we'll be looking for um, to identify alternative uh, funding sources for things that aren't, don't um, sort of naturally fit under a Medicaid contract or wouldn't necessarily be sustained through Medicaid, but we want them sustained in our system. So then the other important thing in all of this is that um, we can't do everything at once. So we are, there is a lot to do, um, a lot of requirements, and we're realizing both at the Healthier Here organizational level, but also at the provider organizational level, um, big system change like this takes time and um, it's a lot of energy and we, we can't do everything at once. And so we have to be um, mindful about how we roll things out. So we know what our current state is. We know where we want to get to. And so the question becomes, how do we lay the cobblestones at the right time in the right order to help achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve? 
And so we've been talking about um, our, our implementation strategy and then by extension our, implement, our investment strategy um, occurring in stages and phases. Um, and uh, so there's kind of two, uh, two swim lanes of work and activities that we think need to happen to get us to where we wanna go. Um, the first is the infrastructure and capacity building. So at the provider organization level, it is we need to make sure that providers have the infrastructure that they need in place to practice differently, to, um, to care for uh, populations of, of people from a population health management um, perspective and to have the infrastructure and quality improvement and uh, registries and, and other capabilities to help make the transition from fee-for-service to value-based payment. Um, and uh, the provi various provider organizations in our region are in different places and having those infrastructures and, cap and capacities. And we refer to these as the marathons, and they're marathons because they don't happen overnight. It's kind of the slow and steady, I think about, of it as the slow and steady infrastructure building. Um, they, it builds upon itself. Some things need to happen before other things can happen. Um, and so, be, you know, being really mindful and just working with organizations, meeting them where they're at to help them have the, the tools and the infrastructure they need. At the same time, we also have to be very mindful that um, one of the big opportunities under the waiver is, um, well, one, we need to improve our metrics to keep the money flowing or we won't be able to do anything. And two is the ability to do quick tests of innovation and proof of concept for new ways of doing business or new uh, care models um, that uh, that we can test out because we have the opportunity to use these incentive dollars in very flexible ways that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so we um, are envisioning a set of targeted innovations um, that improve specific metrics or test new care models, and we call those the sprints. So those are they really are quick tests um, of innovation, proof of concepts um, that we get in, do you know, kind of quick different things and then it's either works and it becomes a marathon and we scale it or it doesn't work and we reallocate the resources to something and try something different. And how we do all of this and order all of this um, uh, is, is very important and we have to take into consideration a number of things including how our implementation and investment strategies build off of one another, being mindful of the revenue drivers, how, the, how we earn the money in, being mindful of what needs to happen first before something else can happen. We want to move as quickly as we can because we're already in the beginning of year three of our waiver. Um, and we want to involve as many partners as we can because that's what's going to lead to systemic sustainability and change. Okay. So we've gone through quite a bit. I'm sure your heads are all exploding and you probably wish you had a box of chocolates at the moment, um, but we appreciate you hanging in there. Um, what we've tried to do um, is set the stage for you all about where we have been, all of the activities and things that have happened over the last two years to get us where we are today, How, what tools and processes we use to make decisions about our investment strategy. Um, and how we're thinking about the staging and phasing um, and a, a approach to implementation and investment. And so now we're going to move on to the budget information um, and which really and answer the question for you, help you understand how much money is going to be available for us to do this work. So on this first slide um, uh, is our overall, um, Healthier Here's overall total budget for the life of the waiver based on um, our best predictions and estimates of how we will perform on our pay for reporting requirements and our pay for performance. So we had to go through, and we did this with a team of subject matter experts, go through each individual metric and make a prediction um, on how we thought Healthier Here is going to perform over the life each year over the life of the waiver, um, and then um, how we think we would do on our pay for reporting to come up with the overall estimate of $97 million. So um, this is our um, up to amount. Now it is possible that we could earn more than this if we um, 
do better on our metrics than we predicted, but um, being conservative um, and making our best guess, we're building a budget off of a total available resource of $97 million. That $97 million is made up of um, project funds and administrative funds. And within the project funds, we have um, project incentives and then our equity and wellness fund and our reserves. So the money that we're talking about being available to Medicaid providers, community-based organizations, and tribes for the life of the waiver is $75 million. And now we're gonna break that down even further because um, you'll remember that the board has already made some decisions about the distribution and allocation of that $75 million by um, provider type, which is on the left-hand side. So by Medicaid providers, community-based organizations, tribes, and uh, what's needed um, at Healthier Here to support implementation. And then by system level investments, which is the old, um, domain one for those of you that have been with us for a while, and then the project um, specific. And so what that means is for um, purposes of today, as we talk about our investment strategy, we're only talking about resources available to our Medicaid healthcare providers. We have about $39.6 million over the life of the waiver uh, to invest um, for Medicaid providers. Okay, the other um, important thing um, to know about the money is that um, when we earn the money is different from when we actually get the money. Um, so we um, have the ability, again, focusing on the Medicaid dollars to earn about $39 million. And this shows you how much of that $39 million we earn by each year of the waiver, 2017 through 2021, which are the, the um, contracted years of the waiver. And you can see that um, 2018 is our highest earning year. What we earned last year was the highest amount of money we can earn in all of the years of the waiver. But when we get the money looks really different. So this next slide shows how, when we receive that $39 million year by year. And you can see that we didn't start receiving any money until 2018 and that um, money stretches all the way out till 2023, which is, um, again, two years past the length of the waiver. Um, the other thing to note about this graph is that the funding goes off of um, a funding cliff very quickly, such that the most amount of money that we are gonna have um, is the money that we have now and what we'll get this year. And there's very, very little available in the out years. And so in order to um, be most strategic and most impactful, we have to look to smooth that curve out a little bit so that we don't go off a financial cliff and spend all our money in 2018 and 2019 and then have nothing left for the out years to continue the work that we need to do. We also have already spent some of that money. So of the estimated $39.6 million that we'll earn um, for Medicaid providers, we have already um, put out 6.2 million of that dollars that we've already given to our Medicaid um, partners. And so that um, leaves us with $33.4 million remaining from now until 2023. And so this graph shows um, the finance, how the finance committee has um, uh, recommended to smooth that finance cliff a little bit, smooth our estimated budget for each year of the waiver, and the use of that $33.4 million um, from 2019 out till 2023. And you can see that it um, takes into consideration as we move into implementation, the ramp up that will happen this year and into next year, and then the ramp down. And so with this smoothing and all things considered, it leaves us with about $8.7 million to spend in 2019 um, to invest in uh, the Medicaid healthcare delivery system and partner organizations. All right, how are we doing? Uh, no questions yet. All right. Hopefully you're all doing doing all right. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through next 
is the draft um, of our 2019 investment strategy, and it's um, it is draft because unfortunately, due to our increment weather, our fourth and final investment prioritization joint committee meeting that was supposed to happen yesterday had to be canceled. Um, so we will be looking forward to hopefully rescheduling that in the next week. And I'll show you a little bit about what's going on with that and what our timeline is. Um, so just know that this, there might be some changes to this, um, but this is where we're at today. Um, so this is a repeat of the slide I showed you earlier um, at the very beginning, um, what our board decided uh, success would look like for us, reminding us that this is kind of our North Star of what we're trying to achieve by the end of the waiver period. Um, then we had an investment prioritization process and tool that left us with these 12 um, ranked strategies, some of which kind of connect together and others um, uh, others don't. And the question becomes, how do we take these 12 ideas um, and strategies of things to invest in um, and, uh, and put them together in a way and stage them and phase them in a way that moves us forward and advances us to our North Star of those um, four, I, four um, goals that I showed you earlier. And uh, so this is what this is how we think we do that, and how we think we put those twelve um, strategies together. We basically ha um, are thinking about them in, as three investment categories. The first is work to strengthen the foundational system infrastructure and capacities um, within our provider organizations. The second category is um, working on tools that will enable um, us all to do whole person care and um, through clinical and community linkages. And the third category of investments are investments that will catalyze and test cross-sector innovations that will improve outcomes. And we think about sort of the first two categories in that conceptually in that marathon way that it's going to be sort of that slow and steady um, uh, uh, staging and phasing of the work to get us where we need to go. And the catalyzing and testing cross-sector innovations will be those sprints around specific, whether it's specific outcomes that we're targeting or specific care models. So I'm going to break these down a little bit more for you. We'll start with establish a strong foundation. Um, again, you'll remember that we talked earlier about the importance for providers to have the tools and infrastructure necessary in, um, and in place in their organization to manage population health and make the transition to value-based payment. And so part of our job is to help, the, uh, help provider organizations build that infrastructure and learn how to use it. Um, and this will be done through um, us brokering at the system level, um, different types of training and technical assistance and project, um, practice coaching for individual organizations around the various topics that are connected to um, building that infrastructure and having those tools in place. And as you look at these slides, um, look and you look at the bold type, um, each of the bolded items tracks directly back to one of the 12 things on that prioritized list, the 12 investment strategies that were ranked and prioritized. So you can start to see how those um, individual single investment strategies get built into um, a, a, um, a category or investment approach that, um, that builds and strengthens the foundation of the provider organization. And part of the process for this um, will also be to provide incentives to our partners for making progress along the pathway of building that infrastructure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, oh, I'll say one more thing about that, um, which is that, again, providers are in different places with where they're at with their infrastructure. And so we really will be working to meet providers where they are. Um, and so some providers will have more training technical assistance and practice coaching that they need than other providers. And so it will be modified and adapted to where providers are at. And um, so again, with the staging and phasing, some providers will move slower along that marathon and others will be, um, you know, are halfway through the marathon and can then move on to the next stage and phase quicker. 
Um, under the second category, tools that enable whole person care through clinical and community linkages, um, these are things that uh, are really um, uh, going to support the system in creating that interconnectedness and that information sharing that we're looking for. Um, and many of these things, um, like I talked about with the shared care plan, are not something we can just go and invest in tomorrow. And so um, Healthier Here's role in 2019 will start with convening our clinical and con community partners together to co-develop the blueprints for these system-wide models. So I talked about the shared care plan. That one in particular um, will need to convene partners to define the data elements, develop the different workflows. We also need to design um, and implement a pilot of a shared care plan in 2019. That's one of our 2019 healthcare authority deliverables is to pilot a shared care plan. And part of that process is also determining what kind of technology or platform is needed to support a shared care plan or where would a shared care plan live. So there's many, um, many factors and many steps that go into um, the staging and phasing of getting us to a shared care plan that we can pilot this year and then work out and refine through the pilot activities and then take it to scale in 2020, 2020 next year where we might see a much larger investment um, of resources on the part of Healthier Here um, for the shared care planning. Um, similar with the standardizing the social determinants of health and how we screen for them, um, a community information exchange as well. We need to convene partners and experts and investors and figure out how we best um, develop and fund such a system in, in our region. And then finally, we have our um, third category, which is really to catalyze and test innovations in our region. And this is to provide seed funding so that we can do um, focused pilots of innovation that leverage our provider change plans and some of the innovative things that uh, providers are either are already doing or want to do. Um, we will develop um, in partnership with our clinical and community partners what these tests of innovation will be. Um, as I mentioned, some will focus on specific metrics. For example, we're working um, right now on um, uh, potential innovations that would reduce preventable emergency department use. Um, others will uh, build capacity for things like um, positions like community health workers or peer, su peer support specialists or other, um, other uh, non-traditional staff that su um, support different uh, care models that are really innovative care models within the community, um, and we would test those as well through this fund. Okay, and this um, matrix then is just sort of another way to take, you'll see on the left hand side, the rank order of the 12 um, investment strategies, and then on the right, you can see how they map to those three um, categories uh, for our investment approach, whether they support the foundational system infrastructure, um, tools to promote whole person, um, enable whole person care and clinical community linkages or um, those that will catalyze and test innovation in our region. All right, um, in terms of what's gonna happen next, um, Obviously, uh, we need to finalize the cost estimates for the priori prioritized investment strategies. We are um, in the process of doing that, nearly done, and hope to uh, get that to our joint committees um, when we have our meeting. We will then need to look at what is the total cost of all of those investment strategies compared to the um, estimated revenue we think we have available to spend in 2019, which is that $8.7 million. Um, and so at the next investment strategy meeting, which is being rescheduled, uh, we will review all the cost information and look for cost revenue gap or surplus. Um, and if there is a gap, which means the investment strategies cost more than the $8.7 million, we'll make adjustments, and if they're surplus, we would then make adjustments to look at additional things um, to resource. The joint committees will then come up with a finalized recommendation um, that will then go back to the finance committee to be packaged up, and a decision memo will go to our governing board, 
for their March 7th meeting. Um, our goal is to have the governing board approve this investment strategy and budget um, at the March 7th meeting so we can quickly move into developing contracts with our um, healthcare practice partners um, and get uh, start to get funding released and, and um, start to move forward on all of the, the strategies that we're hoping to complete in 2019. So with that, um, shockingly, I can't believe I got that in in an hour, um, hopefully you're all not too overwhelmed and um, you might have some questions for me. This is a reminder that you can ask questions through the chat box or you can raise your hand and ask your question out loud. Okay, so we have a couple questions already. Okay. Uh, the first one comes from Sherry McCabe from King County. Her question is, what comprises clinical best practices? So um, in the clinical best practices that we have um, actually a list uh, of um, clinical best practices that has been gathered through all the mechanisms that I talked about of trainings that providers are looking for to support them. It includes everything from mo training and motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care, adverse childhood experiences. Um, to specific trainings around some of the models that are detailed in the toolkit, um, like the Coleman model for care transitions um, and so forth. So um, part of the work that will be happening early in 2019 with our learning collaboratives will be narrowing down that list, um, also staging and phasing it. Obviously, we again, we can't do everything and we can't train in everything in one year. So we'll be working with um, our practice partners to decide which trainings, in addition to some of the other things we'll already be doing, which additional trainings might we want to bring in 2019 versus 2020 and so forth. Great. Thank you, Susan. We've got another question. Uh, this one from Public Health, Seattle and King County, Marielle Torres Metapore. Uh, she's asking about the shared care plan pilot in that second bucket. Mm -hmm. So in the shared care plan pilot, could you share if the focus will be in physical beha behavioral health care coordination? Actually, the shared care plan pilot will um, be in the realm of care transitions. And the reason for that is because that is what the health care authority has required of us is to do a test pilot of a shared care plan for care transitions from hospital and or psychiatric settings. Our hope and our plan for that generally um, is we will start very small, but the goal will be to involve, you know, at least one hospital, one community primary care clinic, and one community behavioral health clinic, and start to build it out from there. Um, once the work is done with, with all of our partners involved in defining what the care plan looks like, um, and then go from there. But it will be around the care transitions project because that is the requirement as a starting point. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Uh, now we have a question from Howard Springer. He says uh, he's asking about the CBO integration into the process. Uh, CBO priorities might inform the catalyst funding or help structure priorities. Yes. Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, it, they, it absolutely will. And, and actually, one of the requirements um, that we will have with regard to the innovation fund is any innovations that get funded out of that will be required to be a clinical community partnership. So it won't be, we won't just be providing resource, um, you know, to, for example, a hospital to do an ED utilization project on their own. We, um, our expectation will be they'll have a community partner and will really be working on keeping people out of the emergency department. Um, so the, we are um, confident that uh, the pace at which our community-based organization work is moving, that um, by the time we get to the point of resourcing through the innovation fund, we'll be able to have be in the, in the place to be brokering those partnerships or helping to build those partnerships. Um, we also intend through our um, community and consumer voice committee and um, some of the other uh, community and CBOs that have been involved with us will be bringing community to the table in the design work that will start even before the CBOs are selected. So um, to have that voice very active in, in design um, even as we're going through the process of selecting. Great, thank you. And we are waiting for some more questions. And I want to remind folks that you can click on the hand icon. You'll see on the slide how to do that. And if you do that, I can unmute you so you can ask your question verbally, provided you're on computer audio or you've entered a PIN. 
if you called in by phone. And feel free to type in your question as well if you're more comfortable doing that. Too bad there's no Valentine songs we could sing or something. I don't know any. So we'll give it a few minutes for people to think of their questions. Maybe I'll uh, I'll do our um, public service announcements. Um, is this it? No. Yeah, and actually we've got a we've got another question. Oh, okay. Yeah, again from uh, Howard Springer. Uh, is the C CBO process going to use the four current committees similar to the clinical? priority process or will there be a different way of doing that? In terms of uh, for going through the investment process, um, uh, the, yes, the four committees will be involved. Um, I anticipate that there might be, um, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to think about the additional, um, if there needs to be additional community involvement in that process beyond the CCV, the um, Consumer and uh, Community Voice Committee, but yes, all four committees will be involved in the same way. Okay, and again, feel free to raise your hand if, if you have a question you'd like to speak, or you can type it in in the questions box. So while people are thinking of questions, I will let you know that Healthier Here is hosting our um, another quarterly webinar, training webinar for all of our uh, partners. This one will be um, on transportation, um, a game changer for care coordination. It will be on February 20th um, from noon to one. And uh, this slide gives you a little bit of information. Um, we'll have a... Um, a subject matter expert on this from Seattle Children's. Uh, she's amazing um, and knows so much about how that system comes together with Medicaid um, work. So I highly encourage you to participate and attend if you can. Great. Th thank you, Susan. Uh, we have a question from our COO, Gina Morgan. Uh, she'd like us to say something about uh, the timing of our CBO approach, kind of what we know at, at this point. Okay, so um, right, so what um, we have narrow, we're, so let me say um, we have been, the process has been that we first cast the net really wide. Um, at the end of 2018, we held a number of in-person and webinar information sessions for community-based organizations all over the county um, to let them know that Healthier Here was here and what the opportunity was over um, available through the waiver. Through that process, we then invited um, any of the CBOs that uh, participated and any other ones that we knew to complete a um, community organization information form so that we could learn a little bit about who they are, who they serve, what kinds of services they provide to look for alignment with um, both Healthier Here's values as well as with the goals of the Medicaid Transformation Project. We have um, just uh, completed the process of going through all of those. There were about 98 or something, I think, um, information forms that were submitted. Um, we've gone through a process of uh, reviewing them, um, as I said, for alignment with Healthier Here Values and the Transformation Project. We will be inviting a subset of those that um, completed those forms to uh, complete a uh, current state assessment with us here in the next week or so. The assessment will be released. Um, that assessment will come in um, in, uh, you know, it'd probably be three weeks or so time frame to fill it out. Um, that will come in and be reviewed and then we will then invite a subset of those providers that completed the current state assessment to complete an innovation plan um, similar to the change plans that were completed on the medical side. Um, and these are going to be the subset of 
uh, community-based organizations and social service providers that are most aligned with um, Healthier Here and the work of the Medicaid transformation projects that can um, serve in a role that supports uh, the goals of the projects and the, and the outcomes in particular. So around the areas of care transitions and addressing the opioid crisis and integrated care and care transitions from the various settings. Um, and, uh, and then once we have them, which will be probably um, by April, uh, the, they will, that pool of practice partners, similar to the pool of practice partners on the uh, medical side, we will then be bringing all of the practice partners, medical and community, together um, to, uh, to begin to work together and build those relationships. And if there's any lingering questions, feel free to raise your hand to be unmuted or type them into the questions box. We really do want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, hopefully this information has been helpful and has kind of caught you up to where we're at. Um, assuming all goes well and the board approves the investment strategy um, at their March meeting, we will then um, be making more information available as to exactly uh, what that investment strategy will look like and um, how much uh, resource will be attributed to the various categories um, and then uh, what the kind of timeline and rollout will start to look like so uh, so that people are aware. Those of you on the phone that might be practice partners and participating in the learning collaboratives will certainly get more detailed information um, through that mechanism and, and through the, the building of contracts. Um, but for um, those of you that aren't in that practice partner pool, we will continue to make information available. We'll um, be continuing to host um, on some kind of either every other month or quarterly basis update webinars. Um, we have a monthly newsletter that comes out and also um, our website is another good place to stay informed and get information about what's going on. So any last questions, Tavish? Yeah. Nothing so far. Okay. But you can always reach out to us yeah, after this webinar via email. We're always happy to answer your questions. Yes. Please do, and thank you again. Um, hope everybody has a terrific day, and happy Valentine's Day, and stay safe out there. Take care.